the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve, Sci Cafe. This is a monthly uh, virtual series that we produce to gives us a platform to share information about science, um, especially being conducted in Apalachicola Bay, but in this case, it's it's about an interesting science topic. So um, our program's about an hour in length and we should have time for discussion and questions. Alicia Bruno will be our producer. And um, <clears throat> to ask a question, you can either raise your hand or come off mute. Um, today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Doolin. Um, he is going to talk to us about uh, fungi, and I'm sure you've heard all the fungi jokes in your lifetime, <laughs> Dr. Doolin. Uh, but uh, Tom is a, a friends, the Friends of the Reserve board member, and we're excited he's, today he's going to tell us about uh, well-known um, members of the fungi family and um, just all sorts of uh, things about what distinguishes the fungi of plants and animals, uh, what exactly is a mushroom. Um, and Tom is now retired. He's a, a professor um, emeritus of biological science at Butler University where he taught for 32 years. Um, okay, and Tom, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Anita, and thank you all for tuning in. I've got a good bit of stuff here as someone who likes to talk about fungi would probably expect to have, and so I'll just jump right in. Um, the fungi are an enormously important group, as I guess anybody might say about the group they love, um, but they do have, in fact, tremendous implications for how things work on the planet, um, how things function in ecosystems, um, and all kinds of practical stuff relative to immediate human impact. Um, everything you see on the screen here are all various sorts of fungi producing pretty amazing looking fruiting bodies, and we'll talk about what all those things are uh, in the next few minutes. First of all, uh, I like to think the fungi as my friend or our friend. Uh, one classic example, of course, would be penicillin, which is a compound produced by the fungus penicillium that was discovered by Fleming in 1927 to have antibacterial properties. Um, it turned out that it worked against bacteria in the, in the soil and it also worked against bacteria in us. Um, it had profound effects, positive effects, for the stop of disease and infection. Um, stinky cheeses, uh, we owe to the activity of fungi, Robert, Camembert, Brie, um, obviously, lots and lots of fermented products that we owe to fungal activity commercially, things like soy sauce, uh, kombucha, uh, the so-called uh, health drink. And of course, we can't talk about fungi without giving them credit for their role in causing bread to rise for us as a result of fermentation. And speaking of fermentation, we can't go on without talking about the production of beer and wine also due to the presence and activities of yeast. Um, Fungi have also, as it turned out, in the last 10 to 15 years have been developed quite extensively as bioremediation agents, which means things that can go into a polluted uh, environment and remove the contaminants. And it has all to do with the way in which the fungus makes its living. Um, and we will talk about how that happens and why this can happen. Um, but it's getting to be quite, a, quite, quite much more than a cottage industry these days. Of course, what you probably learn most about fungi, if you can reflect on your education in biology, is their role as decomposers in ecosystems. Um, and that's what you see in the bottom here in this little white square, um, dead plant material, dead animal material, various other sorts of organic wastes. Um, fungi are instrumental in breaking those materials down and releasing those nutrients back into the back into the environment where they can be used by other organisms. Um, there's also a very interesting aspect of mycology called cell mycology, which is essentially the study of how fungi are used in human cultures for food, for medicine, and in various sorts of rituals. Uh, this particular um, panel that you see is from the Codex in Florence, Italy from 1941. It shows uh, Nahua, which you also might know as an Aztec tribesman, 
nibbling on fungi and getting access to the underworld. And the underworld agent you see is on the right. So people have known for a very long time that fungi have various sorts of both medicinal but hallucinogenic properties. Um, this is another famous one, the so-called fly agaric and an item of scaria. Um, it has been thought and developed that this is perhaps the source of the soma in Hindu and Zoroastrian uh, culture. Um, the ritual that had to do with sipping an extract of soma um, and imparting immortality. Um, however, recently, some people believe that it probably has something to do with this fungus instead. An extraction of the famous magic mushroom, Psilocybe Genesis, um, which contains two psychoactive compounds, psilocybin and psilocin. Um, and by the way, these are have been examined recently for medical applications, particularly in easing anxiety, as well as schizophrenia and depression. Um, and uh, they are abundant, by the way, in our area down in North Florida, South Georgia, and South Alabama, and can be found routinely in the spring and summer on mountains. However, fungi have another side, um, a darker side, if you will. Um, they can act as disease-causing agents. They can act as parasites, um, and and they're formidable in that regard. Uh, we see here a number of uh, a number of diseases caused by fungi: rice blast disease, the upper right-hand corner here, produces losses on average globally of between 30 to 35 percent in yield, which is sufficient to feed about 60 million people. Um, we see gray mold, which show up on the fruits that you bring home from the, from the supermarket and show up as you store them in your blueberries or your raspberries. Uh, these infections occur, typically they're caused by the genus Botrytis, um, and they usually happen when infection occurs in the field and the fungus waits until after the fruit has been ripened and picked um, to, to produce its uh, activity. Uh, another very famous pathogen is the wheat rust um, cinea, causes several different subcinia species, causes global losses again, anywhere from 25 to 40% depending on the year. So these are you know, profound impacts that fungi have as far as disease causing organisms with respect to food insecurity. Um, and fungi have played a role in history in various ways. Of course, the most famous example I most people know of is the Irish tomato blight caused by Phytophthora infestans. Phytophthora literally means plant destroyer. Um, although it didn't contribute, some people argue, necessarily to the famine that swept through Ireland in the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s, but it certainly was a contributing factor to destroying the tomato crop which was on order of one of the major sources of calories for the Irish people, certainly the poor, um, and was extensively cultivated, um, ended up killing over that five or six year period about a million people by estimates, and caused another two million to immigrate from Ireland to Canada, the United States, Australia, um, and the Irish population reduced by about 25%. Um, so it, it Profoundly impactful fungus in regard to spreading Irish culture around the globe, in a sense. So, what we're going to talk today a little bit about various aspects of fungi, and here's the structure of our talk. Uh, I'll first talk a little bit about how fungi are classified, talk about what characteristics distinguish fungi from plants, animals, other organisms. Um, I'll talk a good bit about reproduction in fungi because that is what most of you see. When you see a mushroom in the woods, you're looking at a reproductive structure in the fungi. Um, but it turns out that that's just a little bit of the organism. Most of the organism is hidden out of sight, either embedded in soil, embedded in rotting wood, and it's very, very extensive in its, in its reach and its size. Um, I'll also then talk a little bit about some of the interactions that fungi have with other organisms, plants, Fungi, excuse me, plants, animals, algae, um, and talk about something known as fungal mutualism. And hopefully, we'll have some time at the end to talk a little bit about collecting and identifying mushrooms. Um, so let's uh, move on. The fungi are located, and by the way, I'm not going to talk extensively about classification because it has been 
built and rebuilt in the last 20 years, mainly due to the advent of the use of what's called molecular technology, or in other words, using DNA sequences to determine how closely related organisms are for GM and species and species groups. Um, basically, fungi belong to what is now known as the domain unit. You can see they're over here on this branch. Fungi and animals are more closely related to each other, much more so than fungi are related to land plants, which was a bit of a surprise that was revealed in their taxonomy. Um, oh, about 25 years ago. When we talk about classification, and again, this probably brings, brings back bad dreams of um, high school biology, um, but essentially it is a hierarchy, meaning that it's sort of a nested sequence or a nested combination of categories. The most general, of course, would be all of life, top of this diagram. Within life, we find three domains, the eukarya, the Okea and the bacteria. Um, within a domain, you will find kingdoms. Within a kingdom, you may find one to many phyla. Within a phylum, you may find one to many classes, and so on and so forth. Um, and eventually, we get to the most specific idea we have in classification the individual organism that has a specific name um, that is two words, known as binomial nomenclature. Uh, this harkens back to the 18th century um, Swedish botanist Linnaeus, who we uh, give credit for developing this system of classification. Every organism gets two names, a genus name. In this case, we're looking at the species us, Homo sapiens. The genus is the first word, the species is the second word, genera is all capitalized, and in type set, it is all italicized. Um, right now, there is only one living species in the genus Homo. That's us. Everybody on the planet has the same, we're all the same genus and species. Um, however, 50 to 60,000 years ago, it is suggested there might have been at least two members of the genus Homo alive Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalus or the Neanderthal. This is Agaricus bisporus. This is a particular mushroom of commerce. So the baby bell mushrooms that you buy in the store, this is what you find. Um, Agaricus is a very large genus, meaning that it has many species in it, somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 40, depending on who you're talking to, perhaps more. We're going to talk about three of the phyla in the kingdom fungi. That is the official name of the kingdom. Um, there are seven recognized phyla, but we don't have time to talk about these others, and frankly, you would probably never see them, although some of my favorites are in these other phyla. The glomerica, no, not the glomeromycota, eating um, About 200 plus species, a fairly small um, phylum, um, but this is where what are called BA mycorrhiza are found, so they're important. We'll talk a bit more about them in a few minutes. The Astomycota, this is the biggest phylum in the kingdom fungi, uh, at least 60,000 species, but species concepts in the fungi are very fluid. You can see people that would say there are 100,000, you can read people that say there are 30. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit of a, it's the case for all these phyla. Here we're looking at the yeast, the molds, fungi, the lichen fungi, truffles, um, finally the basidia. About 35,000 plus species, and again, same conditional here. Could be more, could be less, probably more. Here we're talking about the mushrooms, popcorns, the kelp fungi, stinkhorns, jelly fungi, rust, and other common names. There are about 1,700 species that are distributed over the other four phyla combined. And so, although they are important in their own right, um, you'll probably never encounter them. So, the Ascomycota. Let's just quickly give you some views of them. Uh, the fungi, morels, truffles. This upper left hand corner, this is an example of a fungus. This is the genus Sarcocypha. Very common on burned in burned areas on downed wood. Um, and so if you walk through any of the burn areas and take cell state floors, um, a week or two after a burn, you will almost certainly see these. And of course, we can't talk about the Ascomycota without talking about morels. 
This is the, the genus Morchella, uh, species Esculenta, um, a delightfully good edible. In the left hand corner down here, we have truffles. In all these cases, what you're looking at are the quote unquote fruiting bodies. You're looking at the reproductive structure of the fungus. Um, but a lot more of the fungus is out of sight, um, underneath the ground, in the wood that you cannot see. And of course, within the Astomycota, we have the yeast. They are microscopic, very important commercially, um, and they're also very important in the wild. Uh, they don't produce what you would normally think of as a mycelium, which we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, in the case of yeast, grow, growing and, and making spores are the same thing. Um, absolutely the same thing. So let's just talk about, in the simplest way we can, the characteristics that would put fungi in their own kingdom uh, and that would isolate them from the other kingdoms of organisms. Um, first of all, they're eukaryotic. Um, a lot of things are eukaryotic, so we're not distinguishing them quite that. That just means that they have a cellular structure that is fairly complex. Things like nuclei, things like mitochondria are present in these cells. We ask that, back to your biology background, um, we talk about prokaryotes, the other type of cell we find in nature, um, and these we would associate with bacteria, mostly. And they're microscopic, fairly simple, single chromosome, one strand of DNA, um, and not particularly differentiated cytoplasm or the stuff that's inside of the cell. Contrast that with a typical eukaryotic cell, and in this example, I'll use an animal. All of a sudden, you see lots of different compartments that are membrane bound that do very specialized things for the eukaryotic cell. If this were a plant cell, we'd have at a cell wall that everything inside would be quite similar. If we would have to add chloroplast, then we'd have to add a central vacuole. If this is a fungal cell, we get rid of the central vacuole, we get rid of the chloroplast, but everything else is quite similar. So eukaryotes share a lot of similarity at the cellular level, and fungi are eukaryotic. Fungi exhibit what is called a heterotrophic mode of nutrition. And what this means is, unlike plants, which can quote unquote manufacture their own food through photosynthesis, they're called autotrophic. Fungi can, they don't have that facility. Um, so they depend on getting their food from complex organic sources that have already been built, not surprisingly, by plants. Um, or, in the case of some fungi that are pathogenic on humans or other animals from the animals. What they do is they secrete enzymes from their bodies, if you will, into the environment. These enzymes break down the complex organic molecules and the smaller subunits of those molecules are then reabsorbed back into the body of the fungus to be used. And that, of course, is what makes them such profoundly efficient decomposers. They just move along through the soil or move along through a log, secrete enzymes, mostly at their tips as they grow along, break down the material that they're growing through, absorb what they can and move on, um, leaving other behind for other decomposers. Fungi are particularly good at producing enzymes in this eating process, if you will, this extracellular digestion. Um, in producing enzymes that attack plant materials. Cellulose, primary structural component of a plant cell wall. Lignin, another component of a plant cell wall in things like xylem cells, for example, that transport water in vascular plants. Gives the cell wall of those cells rigidity, makes them essentially waterproof. And pectin, which is a gel-like component, sort of keeps all those structural units together. Those of you who make jellies and jams are familiar with the ability of pectin to make things kind of gel and set up. So it's a commercially important product as well. Um, but fungi are very good at detecting that down. What you see here is the fungus from the genus penicillium um, making its way through uh, what's left of a lemon. And you see this sort of manifestation of fungal growth um, doing its thing when you look at. Helicopter from spot, which is uh, very common. 
And if you look at these spots, you will see how fungus, how a fungus would grow, and this is the Polytotricum genus, how it would grow in a fairly homogeneous, well available nutrient source. You'll notice that the growth patterns are very circular, they're radial. Um, and we'll find out why that is uh, case shortly. Um, finally, oh, another thing is fungi have what are called filamentous body plants. So that just means they produce microscopic tubular structures that are called high heat singular, high heat plural. And they're surrounded by a cell wall that is composed of chitin uh, to contrast that with plants, which use primarily cellulose as their cell wall structural component. Um, and yes, that's the same chitin that are found in the exoskeleton of insects. Uh, another little tip off as to why the fungi are more closely related evolutionarily to animals instead of plants. Um, this is a microscopic photograph uh, of a fungal hypha. It happens to be from a jelly fungus. Uh, Tumasmella is the name of the genus. On the right, right you can see this particular hypha has been treated with um, a chemical dye that would illuminate the presence of the nuclei. So it's staining the DNA that is present in the nucleus. Um, you can see that these are tubular structures. They frequently branch. And in this case, the nuclei occur in pairs. Um, that has significant implications for this particular fungus and the group that it's in. Don't have time to do the genetics of it, but I'd be happy to answer questions about it if people are interested. It's a very it's quite a remarkable story in some sense. Um, reproduction in fungi, this is another distinguishing feature, is by spore. Um, what is a spore? It's essentially a microscopic unit of dispersal. Um, it can be produced in two modes of reproduction in most fungi, either by a sexual process or by an asexual process. And just again to remind us what that might mean. Um, in asexual reproduction, what that means is you receive all of your genes as an offspring from a single parent. Um, so that would be analogous to you being able to just sort of take a little chunk of yourself and toss it out that into, into nature and it would be, you'd regenerate your whole self. Um, this is something that, of course, things like starfish are capable of doing all the time. They'll break off a leg or have the leg broken off uh, and it will regenerate. Um, so they are asexually reproducing part of their body. In the case of reproduction, it requires two genetically distinct individuals to bring a contribution to the next generation. So if you were thinking about this in the case of humans, you'd be talking about sperm cells from male, egg cells from females, coming together to produce a zygote that is the next generation um, that will develop into the next generation in its combination a genetic contribution from two different individuals. Most fungi have the ability to use either one or both, depending on the conditions. So if we were to talk about what a spore can do, it will initially be shed or dispersed, and we'll talk about how that happens in a little bit. But the spore, when it lands in a conditions where are advantageous, which we're talking about proper moisture, um, nutrient source that it can explore, um, it will undergo what's called germination. This germ tube will continue to elongate in a epical fashion from its as it continues to digest, absorb, and grow. The hypha begin to branch and grow and grow, and eventually will produce this thing that we will then call a mycelium. And you'll notice this mycelium overall has a bit of a radial component to it. It's a circle. That just represents the fact that the fungus is exploring all directions for the food source that it is sitting in to secrete it, digest, in other words, break down larger molecules and digest the smaller molecules across their wall into their bodies to be able to support their, their lifestyle. And so if you put a spore on a plate of homogeneous, this is a petri dish, with something called agar in it, which is a jelly-like material that has nutrients the scientists would put into it. This fungus, as you can see, will sort of grow uncontrollably in all directions and produce this radial, this circular colony. Um, in the wild, things oftentimes look a little bit different. 
Um, on the left, we have some fungal mycelia, but in this case, we flip over a log and we're looking underneath it. And what you see are these quite visible and quite wide, uh, quite high diameter um, structures called rhizomorphs, which are high concentrations of hydrogen that are growing in a way to sort of bridge themselves to some other nutrient source that's present that it would prefer to go after. On the right, though, we see the underside of a leaf, and you can see how many spores have fallen, and they're growing in a radial fashion. They're growing in a substrate that's more or less uniformly available to them. And so they're going to go explore in as many directions as they possibly can. Cherry rings, another example of the same phenomenon. In this case, the fungus started its life in the middle, it's growing out in all directions over time. I don't know if you can see this on your screens, but you might notice that the inside of the fairy ring is not, the grass is not quite as darkly green as the outside of the fairy ring. That is because as the fungus is growing out, it's digesting extracellular material and absorbing it back in. One of the nutrients it's bringing in is nitrogen. Um, and it's feeding the nitrogen to available quantities of the grass. And that means the grass is just not going to be quite as big um, as it would like to be. See around the perimeter, these are all the quote unquote mushrooms that are being produced at the very growing edge of this large mycelium. Um, this happens to be the genus Derica, which pretty commonly makes fairy wings. Um, you will see them often in Florida for sure. So, how big can a fairy ring be? How much longer will this sort of growth go on? Well, this is the record that we currently know for the largest single organism on Earth. Um, this happens to be a single mycelium, a single colony of, the, of a fungus in the genus Armillaria. Um, it covers about 0.3 k acres, 285 acres, about three and a half miles across, and it's believed to be somewhere between 3,000 and 8,000 years old. Um, how does a mycologist figure this out? Well, it's the result of the advent of molecular technologies, where they've been able to go in and use those techniques to genotype samples from all around, samples from mushrooms that are produced in this area, and they discovered that this fungus is a single genotype. In other words, it's a clone, um, a single individual. Um, mycologists think this is just the beginning. And we'll find more and bigger colonies. Um, keep a look. Let's um, let's move on and talk just a little bit about reproduction in fungi. Um, first of all, under a set of prescribed conditions, and we can talk about those in depth. But essentially, it's moisture, temperature, maturity. Um, the fungus will produce into the air something called a fruiting body. In other words, a mushroom would be an example. And this mushroom is where the spores will be produced. These are all examples of fruiting bodies that you see here on this slide. Um, obviously, mushrooms, cup fungi, earth stars, jelly fungi, these are all fruiting bodies that are being produced for the sole purpose of producing spores and dispersing spores. The geometry, the mechanics of these fruiting bodies are about not only producing the spores, but about making sure those spores are disseminated. Because fungi don't walk, they don't run, they don't fly. Um, so if they're going to get around, they're going to have to do it making sure their spores get around. So if we were to look at a typical recognizable mushroom, on the underside of this thing you know as the cap, you will find the spore producing structure. All of this is fungal hyphae that is differentiated in a specialized way. If you were to take a look at one little edge of one of these gills, what you would find is masses of hyphae that you'll find these specialized structures, in this case, that are called basidia. And on each basidium, four basidiospores are being produced. This process is a sexual process. And so these individual spores are genetically unique individuals. How many spores can a mushroom like this produce? And it could be very short life. Any of you know mushrooms typically don't hang around very long. 
anywhere from 100,000 to a million spores, and that's just sort of on average. There are some fungi that produce more, some that produce less. Um, so if you think about the prevalence of fruiting bodies in nature, and they're everywhere, um, it turns out that if you get a cubic foot of air, you are probably breathing in somewhere between a million to two million spores um, every single time you take a breath. Uh, microscopic, you can't see them. Fortunately, your body, your immune system has the ability to fight that off and not let them infect you. That's not always successful because there are some fungi that are capable of infecting humans um, in, in their lung tissue. Examples would be histoplasmosis, for example. Um, but in any case, the, the atmosphere is thick. Quickly, I'll just toss in here what the parts of a mushroom are. If you were to take a look at one, um, the cap, the gills, and the stalk. That's the common name. Official terminology, all disciplines have them. The cap is the pileus. The gills are called lamella. There's a thing called the stalk, which is a stipe, and oftentimes stalks have little collars on them, which is first to have an annulus. Whoops, didn't want to do that. Sorry, clicked on the wrong thing. Let me get back up here. That'll teach me, won't it? Let's see here. I'll find us here in just a second. We back on? Yep, you're back on. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, and so if we were, again, to take a look at the gill edge, you find these highly specialized structures that are the spore-producing structures called basidia in this case, and they're producing basidial spores. Now, different types of what you might recognize as mushrooms have different spore-bearing surfaces. Um, gills, we've just talked about, this happens to be an example of a gericus, a common meadow mushroom. Uh, the spore color here is brown, and so not surprisingly, the gills are brown. But there are fungi that produce um, a spore bearing surface that is tubular. You would know these generally as bolletes. Um, and if you were to cut that bolete from top to bottom, so in other words, from the top of the pileus to the bottom of the stipe vertically, you can see the tubes arranged um, side by side, and they're essentially literally firing spores down the tubes to be released. Um, there are plenty of fungi that have a folded structure for their spore-bearing um, surface. Uh, one example of a fine edible that's quite abundant in Florida would be sand propels. It's the kind of medium that they have, kind of spore-bearing surface. Um, and there are fungi that produce uh, spores on spines. So they're quite diverse. Not surprisingly, um, identifying a fungus morphologically um, starts in many places in bees with what these fruiting body structures look like and what their spore bearing surface is. Spore dispersal is an engineering marvel, if I can say that, among the fungi. Um, fungi have developed evolutionarily a variety of ways to disperse their spores. Probably the most common way is just to release them into the air. This you see on the left-hand side. Uh, this happens to be a very old shelf fungus, you would call it generally, from the genus Um, It lives from year to year to year, um, and just bigger over time, so it doesn't lot and disappear. Um, and it turns out that it can produce in its lifetime literally trillions of spores that are just blown off the spore-bearing surface, which are underneath here, into the air. This is one that is well known. This is called a stinkhorn from the genus Thallus. Um, and what happens is, as this spore-bearing surface um, matures, it begins to decompose. It releases a very strong odor, which you may have felt while walking in the woods. The odor is that, to the fly at least, of stinking carrion, rotting flesh. The flies gang up on the tip where the spores are being produced. They ingest the spores, carry them away as they fly away. Over here, we have what are called bird's nest fungi. Whoops, bird's nest fungi. 
um, quite small, very common uh, in compost, very common particularly in compost and hardwood. Um, these little things you see inside the nest, quote unquote, um, are called caridioles or eggs. When a splash of rain, believe it or not, when a drop of rain splashes in here, when these caridioles are mature, they are thrown out, a little cord unravels, called a funiculus, it catches on to a twig or a limb or a little, whatever little area or structure above it it can find, it'll wrap around the peridiole or the egg will then decompose and release the force. Lower right hand corner, this is the genus Pylopolis, commonly found on dung, an early colonizer. This particular fungus uses a water cannon to distribute its spore bearing structure, this black structure on the end. It produces this water filled vesicle just below it. And when this water spore producing structure is mature, this vesicle will literally explode and it will launch this little pump you see there on the end. It will launch it into the air at an initial speed of about 60 miles an hour. Um, send it through the air anywhere from three to eight meters. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, we have the famous truffle. Uh, this is dispersed quickly by odor and taste. So in other words, this is a fruiting structure that produces a scent that mammals can detect. They'll dig it up, they'll eat it, and in the process, they will disperse the spores as they go away. Spores are processed through their digestive system. Um, and when they drop their load by the side of the road, um, the spores are there, um, and they are, in fact, already in a nutrient. Let's talk a little bit now about some of the very interesting mutualistic associations that we've seen among the fungi. This is probably one of the more famous in that it's believed that the so-called vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza, also known as endomycorrhizae, sometimes referred to as VAMs, they are believed to have been a predominant, not the only reason why plants were able to colonize land. Um, what we they they functioned essentially as the root system for early plants, early land plants. What you see here is a slice from a fossil that's approximately 400 million years old. And what you see are structures that are very reminiscent of the vesicular, arbuscular, mycorrhizal structures that you would see in modern day root is infected. So this is root tissue that you see here. This is the edge of the root of the cortex, Williams anatomy. And these structures you see here are called vesicles. These are called arbuscles. They penetrated the cell and they are removing nutrients from the root, mostly storage carbohydrate in the form of starch, to supply nutrients to the, to the fungus. Now, I said this is a mutualism, which means it's a two-way street. So what is the plant getting out of the deal? Well, it turns out that this fungus extends quite far beyond the root on the outside of the plant, and it extends the absorptive capacity of the root. And so what, what the plant is getting is access to a wider range of water, access to a wider range of nutrients. Um, some controversy about this, most often we're talking about uh, phosphorus or even perhaps nitrogen. Turns out there are two kinds of mycorrhizae. The endomycorrhizae on the right, we just talked about. You can see the root, you can see the arbuscles here, you can see the extension of the fungus outside. The other type of mycorrhiza that are that are in a completely different, pardon me, completely different phylum are the ectomycorrhiza. Um, ectomycorrhiza do also penetrate the root system, but they're not nearly as invasive. And they are characterized by producing a very extensive sheath around the root. The sheath is referred to as a mantle um, and extends very far beyond the root system itself. You can see this most obviously in this slide where we have a pine ceiling that has been germinated in a or I should say transplanted what's called a microcosm, um, a soil system between two pieces of glass so that they can be observed what has happened. 
in terms of growth, the soil was inoculated with um, the species of ectomycorrhiza that is for the particular find. What you can see here, I hope, is you can see in the sort of orangish color, that is the root system of the find as it extends its way into the soil, reaching for water, reaching for nutrients. But look at the extent to which the fungal mycelium spins the root system of this plant. Um, and so you can see the fungal mantle going around here. You can also see how the fungus is reaching out way beyond the root system. And it has been well characterized that this fungus is delivering water, it's delivering nutrients, very often additional phosphorus to the plant. In exchange, the plant is giving the fungus sugar, um, an energy source on which it can live. So it's a mutualism. Um, both organisms are, are benefiting from the interaction. There's also very, very strong evidence, now I think almost universally accepted among mycologists for sure, that these connections that the fungus has with the plant, the fungus will also have with another fungus of the same species that is inhabiting another plant. And what that means is these plants are connected to each other via this fungal network. Um, and it has been demonstrated that this fungal network can also exchange signals, chemical signals between the plants that are involved. Um, and that this sort of network can be extensive. It can involve dozens, if not hundreds of trees in some cases. And so it really is the case that when you're walking through the woods and you're looking at mushrooms popping up, chances are that underneath those mushrooms, and that's what the ectomycorrhizae are, they're psidiomycota, you find an enormous network of hyphae that are connecting trees um, of similar, or in even some cases, different tree species. This has been referred to as the wood wide web. Um, I put that in italics because it was actually coined. Um, if you drop that into a Google search, you'll find enough stuff to keep you entertained for days. Um, it's really quite a remarkable phenomenon. So you have the trees in the woods, you have the ectomycorrhizal fungus, you have its mycelial network that is in essence connected to the root systems of these trees. It's very remarkable. Um, mutualism between fungi and animals, leaf cutting ants, large communities, up to 8 million ants, community organization. Um, uh, the, the, the ants cut leaves, the leaves are taken down into the nest, and there are specific cast of workers who have inoculum in their mandibles, will chew up and macerate the leaves, inoculate them with fungus. And the fungus then becomes the food for the colony. This was a famous one recently uh, in movie fame, the zombie ant fungus. In this case, a fungus is infected an ant. As it grows through the ant, it eventually takes over the musculature of the ant, drives it to an aerial piece of uh, plant material, and there it dies. And what comes out is a fruiting structure. This happens to be the uh, genus um, Opio corbis cordyceps, and along this, the spores are produced. They rain down on the ground, they fall on other ants, and infect other ants. Another mutualism, lichens, a combination of a fungus and an alga that are living together, often under very difficult environmental circumstances. Either one could survive by itself, it takes them both to, to get along. Um, lichens show up in very unusual places on pure rock, for example. Lichens are also some of the very first recognizable organisms to colonize uh, new volcanically produced islands. Uh, bacteria, of course, are there that you can't see, but as far as visible life, they're among the first that show up. Um, what happens here is the fungus is making up the upper body, if you will, of the lichen. It is protecting the lichen from radiation. It is also supplying the lichen with water, excuse me, the, the alga with water. There's a layer of algal cells that are producing by photosynthesis, feeding the fungus, if you will. The fungus is protecting the alga. And the fungus is also growing into the rock, 
secreting a variety of acids that are breaking the rock material down to supply nutrients for everybody on board, but also a substantial role in producing soil. So I've got a few minutes here to talk a little bit about collecting mushrooms, and I'll, I'll go through this probably faster than I would have liked, but we'll roll um, for another five minutes or so. Um, so if you are to decide to collect mushrooms, here's a few things to remember. Be certain of the ID. Travel with someone with local knowledge, someone who can show you this is good. I've eaten it. It's fine. If you collect mushrooms, don't mix them. If you're going to collect mushrooms, don't just cut them off at the top of the soil. You need to dig out the whole thing, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, you only want to collect full specimens that are fully open, and that's because there are poisonous things that are not mushrooms that is, you might just think and you'll get them early, and you, you'll, you'll make them. Tell someone where you're going to be, obviously. Bring your phone, contact, and you can also load a nice app for my naturalist that will help you in identifying. What you don't want to do, you don't want to eat it if you're not certain. You don't want to eat a mushroom that you eat out as edibles, no matter how good you think you are. I'm pretty good at it, but I don't do that. Um, never eat a mushroom while that's raw. Don't mix mushrooms and alcohol, which doesn't sound like much fun, but it turns out that there are some mushrooms that react with alcohol in the bloodstream that will make you ill. Do not collect what are called in the mycology circles little, little brown mushrooms or LBMs. That's because some of the most toxic mushrooms are in that group. They're hard to key out. Just don't bother. Um, and don't collect gilled mushrooms that have a bulbous base. And I'll make it clear to you in just a second. Um, and do not collect from manicured lawns or roadsides. And that's basically because remember, fungi are absorbing things when they're smelling. And you could have pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals number of things uh, and they'll be in the fruity body. Um, mushroom poisoning is really not that common. Um, this is data from the American Association of Poison Control Centers all across the U.S. Over 2 million cases of all poisonings, less than 0.3 percent by mushrooms. A quarter of the time the mushroom was identified, which is what I'm commonly employed to do here in the Poison Center in Indiana. I'm a I'm a volunteer consultant, and um, several times a year, I have somebody try to tell me, somebody asks me to identify a mushroom that something is eating. Most of the poisoning is recreational use, hallucinogens, and most of it's for all by children. So it just tells you if you've got small kids, don't let them be out roaming in the yard eating mushrooms. Um, and only about 50 cases a year that have major clinical. So it's not that big a deal if you pay attention. And only on average about 20 fatalities worldwide. Uh, the usual disclaimer what I'm telling you here is don't eat mushrooms. <laughs> the collecting kit, um, at least don't eat mushrooms based on the advice you see in this presentation. A collecting kit includes a basket, a knife, your phone, some maps, things to put stuff in. If you're ready to go, you want to pay attention to where you get it. You want to do something called a spore print. You want to take a look at the characteristics of the mushroom and make good notes of all of these things. Um, make notes of where you found it. Make notes of what kind of habitat you found it in. Did you find it single? Was it gregarious? Meaning that there were lots of them spread over a long distance. Uh, were they in rings? Were they in clusters? One basic thing you do to make a to, to, to identify a mushroom is to make what's called a spore print. Basically, you cut the cap away from the site. You put that cap on black and or white paper. You hydrate it just a, a drop or two, um, and then you cover it with some sort of a covering, usually a glass is what works. Wait a few hours, and you get a spore print. Spore prints are commonly from some mushrooms are white. That's why you want to have black paper as well as white paper underneath. Um, and I see here that we are just about to be at the end. So I'll just let this go. Um, here, as we've seen before, some of the things you will see under the cap. The attachment of the gill is important to the site. I won't go over these details because if you're using E, which you will inevitably be using, all of these terms and all these features 
will be described in the foreword or the beginning of the piece. Um, there's also characteristics, thoughts that are important to pay attention. Won't bother with the various words here. Um, something called veils are important, whether they are partial or universal. Veils are nothing more than the remains of the fungus that was left behind when it came out of the ground. Um, and they are important in keying out various kinds of characteristics. So, yes, none of these are true. Pay no attention. Now, the pictures that you're going to see are based on identifications from a very fine biologist who left us in 2017 from the University of Florida by the name of Ian Kimbrough. Um, this is a common poisonous mushroom that you will find in Florida. It's called Chlorophylla mosaites. Um, it's called the false parasol, parasol, or parasol, pardon me, very common in grassy areas. It's poisonous but not lethal, and it's the most commonly reported um, uh, mushroom poisoning in Florida. Um, it's identified by a spore print that is green. So in other words, the spores have a green color in mass, hence the genus name chlorophyllum. Oh, I did it again. Gosh, this one I'm running out of time. I think it's just hiding behind your screen there. So that's good. Got it. Okay. Sorry about folks. That'll teach me to have live uh, links in my presentation. <laughs> Sometimes I give these out and I just, people just like to have the links. Okay. We should be back in business now. There we go. Um, this is one of the reasons why chlorophyll is commonly seen and eaten um, is that it's very similar to a delicious edible called Macrolepiota, but it has a white spore print. And so spore printing will give you a clear idea of one from the other. This is a, a genus um, that is contained probably some of the most lethal mushrooms, and it turns out that they're very common in Florida. It's among the largest genus of Florida mushrooms. The genus is Amanita. They look good. But there are, in fact, deadly species that are present. Um, they are highly variable in their shape and their color, but they sure look good. There are both edible species, but as well as deadly poisonous species. So unless you're an absolute pro, you don't even want to go anywhere near them. Um, the base of the stalk is bulbous, which you see here, and it's underground. That was the reason why I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you're collecting mushrooms, don't cut them off. Dig them up. If you've got a vulva, if you've got this bulbous base, don't touch it. Um, and they all have white to creamy spore prints. Ammonita bisporigia is probably the most lethal that's present in Florida, and it is, in fact, deadly poisonous. Um, and one cat um, could potentially do the job on you. It's referred to as the death agent. Um, it typically is found in mixed forests throughout Florida. Um, this is a common summer mushroom in grassy areas. It's called the Caracas blazii or the almond portobello because it has a very strong almond flavor. It also is believed to have uh, some medicinal properties and is cultivated uh, and grown commercially in Japan uh, for those reasons. Quartinarius semianguinarius, anguinus, pardon me. This is an example of an LBM you don't want to go anywhere near. Um, LBMs are easy to identify because they have this partial veil called a cortina early on. They've all got brown, um, dark brown spore color. Bowl eats, some delicious bowl eats in Florida. This is a nice one. Um, it's considered a choice edible and it's quite common under the so-called evergreen oak. And Cantharellus is the genus, again, common, delicious. They're abundant in Florida, generally from the middle of June to the middle of September, and they have a strong association with oak and pine. And they are mycorrhizal. Um, this is a poisonous. It's sometimes referred to commonly as the golden chanterelle. It grows generally on wood or on buried wood, which is another reason why you dig things up. And it glows in the dark. Its common name is the jack o' lantern fungus. Um, another common um, edible fungus we find in Florida is the so called free agaric, um, the Armillaria melia. It has a white spore print. It's one of the more edible, common edibles that you will find in the winter in Florida. 
So I'll wrap up now. I know I talked a little too long. I hope people stuck around. Um, so thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate your attention. And if you need to get a hold of me, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'd be happy to ask questions. Um, finally, here's some mushroom guides. I can actually have these printed off and, and supply them to Anita or to you directly if you'd like, and some websites if you have an interest uh, in exploring uh, mushrooms further. So uh, on that, I'll call it quits and uh, say thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, we actually have one question from Beth Appleton. She wants to know, um, sure. are there many cases of any fungi species going extinct? Yes, yes, um, good question. Um, the, the fossil record for fungi is not particularly robust. That's oftentimes how we know whether something has either changed or disappeared. Um, but much for the same reasons that we lose animal species, that we lose plant species, um, disruption in habitat um, can be uh, lethal for some species of fungi um, in terms of their ability to keep going. Um, and um, disruption of woodlands is particularly to be particularly problematic for the extinction of some fungi. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we can give it a minute. If anybody else has a question, feel free to drop it in the question box or you can raise your hand and I will take you off mute. In the meantime, Tom, uh, thank you very much. That was well, a lot of knowledge. Um, probably and too I, much. <laughs> you yeah, get me talking I about fungi, it's hard to get me to stop. Yeah, but it was great subject, and uh, I know it's valuable too. We we actually have had a little community um, stir about mushrooms. We have a dog park here, and one of the dogs, a Great Dane of all species, got very ill. Um, really? To the tune of thousands of dollars by eating uh, a mushroom that was growing in the dog park. So everybody's oh, really? really aware of and that. Do you know what it was? Um, I I don't know. Um, nobody was sure what it ate. So, and you know, we see each other infrequently. You may not see the same people at the same time, but right. it was um, definitely documented as a mushroom. So, <clears throat> yeah, interesting that's application. That's one of the examples of why I admit that if you see a mammal nibbling on a mushroom, um, since you're a mammal, you can nibble on it too. Um, that's definitely not a wide species of mushroom. <laughs> yeah, certainly some, not something to be to be uh, trivialized. So you should know what you're That's doing. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You might end up uh, poisoned or uh, going on a trip you're not expecting, <laughs> so to speak. That's correct. Well, and, and the bottom line is, in most cases, unless you happen, unfortunately, on an ammonia, you know, you'll get sick. It'll it'll be unpleasant, but you know it's it's not necessarily going to take you out. But 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 it's just something you just don't want to have to experience if you don't need to, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, we sure appreciate it. Great talk, and um, we are have our next Sci Cafe. We don't have a speaker yet, but it's July twenty seventh. We may or may not be having that one, but on. Um, August 24th, we have Harley Means, the state geologist, and he's going to be joining us talking about the geology of the Apalachicola River, which should be very exciting. And after that, we have archaeologist Dr. Nancy White uh, of the University of South Florida is going to talk about the um, indigenous peoples who populated the area prior to UN, uh European occupation. So thank you all for joining us. And yeah, we, I see a couple of questions there. Oh, is it, you see them? Do we get some please, more? At least on my little thing, it says there are a couple of people with questions. Yes, they are praises saying what a great presentation you did. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks <laughs> very much. Yeah. It was fun. All always right. is. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Tom is on our friends board. So we appreciate your service in that regard, too. Uh, you're very welcome. I enjoy it. And um, Lynn, I see Lynn's in the audience and uh, it's it's a good crew. I like I like working with everybody. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thanks, everybody.